In Matthew 13, the crowds are coming to hear Jesus speak. And there's a large crowd down by the sea. Chapter 13 starts out this way. That day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And large crowds gathered to him. So he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables. Well, <clears throat> Jesus is known for teaching in parables. Even unbelievers recognize the importance of parables in, the te in his teaching. There are seven of them in the 13th chapter of Matthew. And they all have to do with the kingdom. You should be uh, familiar with these seven parables, the sower, the tares, the mustard seed, the leaven, the hidden treasure, the pearl of great price, and the dragnet. In addition to telling these parables, Jesus explains about parables in general, and he gives particular detail explaining the parable of the sower and the parable of the tares. A parable is a brief story used to teach a moral or religious lesson. The way Jesus explains it in Matthew 13, 10 through 17 goes like this. People who are open to the truth will get the points of the story. But people who just refuse to really listen are going to ignore the point. And he says you can profit for listening, or you can suffer for ignoring the points that the stories plainly make. As I mentioned, the common theme of the parables in Matthew 13 is the kingdom. Now, the kingdom is the rule of God in people's lives. The word kingdom is used closely in connection with church, um, particularly when uh, Peter makes his great confession of who Jesus is. But the kingdom has special meaning for what church is. Not the organization, but the relationship of the people of God to God who is their ruler. Think of kingdom as sovereignty or rule or reign more than a place or an organization. There are two particulars that Jesus teaches in Matthew 13 about this kingdom. That it will grow, that it will spread. And also, that in the end, there's going to be some selected from among those who claim to be under God's rule and those who only claim but are not really under God's rule. The parable of the sower. It's a word that we don't use very often. As a matter of fact, my uh, spell check thought it wasn't a word. To sow seed is like the man in this picture. You have seed in your hand and you broadcast it. You throw it out. Well, in this story, Jesus tells about seed that falls in four different kinds of soil. On the side of the road, in rocky soil, in a thorny patch, and in good soil. And he goes on and tells the story, and the results are what you would expect. The seeds that just land on the hard dirt of, by the side of the road, the birds just eat those up. Plants do come from the seed that goes into the rocky soil or the thorny soil, uh, but the plant that uh, grows up in the rocks grows up quickly, but it doesn't have much root and it withers away quickly. The plants that are in the thorns, they grow, but then the thorns choke them out. It's the plants that are, the, the seeds that, that land in the good soil that produce plants that grow and multiply. 
Farther down in the chapter, in verses 18 through 23, Jesus himself explains what the parable is about. The seed that falls on the roadside represents the situation when the evil one, Satan, snatches the word from a hearer's heart before it takes root. The seed in the parable is the word of God. There are people who may open themselves briefly to God's word, but like the roadside seed, it's, it's snatched away from them. Like the bird snatched away the seeds, there are people that it never takes root in their hearts. There are other people who do quickly, joyfully receive God's word, but then those people fall away because things get tough. There's affliction or there's persecution. And that's like seed that falls among rocks that pops up quickly, but it doesn't last. There are other conditions that can inhibit the effectiveness of God's word. There are those who, after hearing God's word, give their attention to the worries and riches in this life. And that worldly thinking chokes out God's word so that it's not fruitful. So what is the good soil? The good soil represents the people who, after hearing and understanding the word, they bear much fruit. The application should be plain. If you'll prepare your heart to receive God's word, if you'll take the trouble to understand it, then it will be productive. It will bear much fruit. There's another parable that he tells and explains, and it is called the parable of the tares. Tares is not a word that we use. It's a, a name of a weed that looks like wheat, as you can see in the picture. In this story, there's a man who has a good wheat field, but his enemy has gone out and he's planted weeds or tares in the field. His servants say, well, let's go pull up all the weeds. But the owner says, wait until the wheat is mature. So you don't kill it in the process. If you're out there pulling up all the weeds, you can pull up the wheat as well. Instead, he tells them when the harvest time comes, then you collect and burn the weeds. Then you harvest the wheat. For this one, Jesus explains the lesson. Jesus is the one who's planting sons of the kingdom. The devil is planting sons of the devil. But it's going to be the end of the age before it's all sorted out. At the end of the age, the angels will take away the stumbling blocks and the lawless people who claim to be under God's rule in his kingdom. And the angels will cast them into the fiery furnace, it says. And that's when the righteous will shine like the sun. Jesus is talking about his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and the reality that there are people who are causing other people to fall. There are people who don't live according to God's standards right there in the midst of the true subjects of the king, the, the true citizens of the kingdom. We're told that in the end, God will sort all that out. There'll be punishment for those who aren't really subject to the king, those who don't really belong in the kingdom. But it's going to be at the end, and only then will the righteous really shine out. We won't take time to go into it in detail, but the parable at the end of the chapter, the dragnet parable, in verses 47 through 52, is a story about fishing with pretty much the same application as the tares. You throw out the net, Pull in whatever you can. And some of it you eat, and some of it you throw away. There are two uh, twin parables that are about the growth of the kingdom. The mustard seed parable and the parable of the leaven. We're told that a grain of mustard seed can produce great things. And we're reminded how small a mustard seed is. 
These parables are short, so we'll read through them. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. This is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it's full grown, it's larger than the garden plant. It becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. You see a picture there of some mustard plants that are taller than a person. Uh, it's a figure of speech to say that it's, it's a tree, but it is something big enough a bird might make a nest in. And then in the middle, you see how tiny a mustard seed is. And, and maybe a more typical mustard plant for the region in which Jesus lived over on the right. Nevertheless, from a very tiny seed, a significant plant grows. I think in his story, he's talking about one that grew more than most. Then he goes on to leaven. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Well, leavening, uh, yeast is leavening, uh, does some amazing things. If you've never made yeast bread, you need to you need to do that just to well to enjoy the yeast bread. But to see, as in this picture, you have this small lump of dough. You put the yeast in it and and uh, very few other ingredients, and you let it set overnight, and it's as big as that one on the right. As much as you see it, it's always interesting. It's always amazing how much it grows. Well, verse 34 says, All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables. He didn't speak to them without a parable. He always had a story to help them get the point, if they were willing, and help them remember the point. There are also parables here about the value of God's kingdom. Move down to verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again, and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. You see a picture there of a treasure that a man found in the 1940s in a field, really. He found it in a field. This was just one. This is the most... Uh, impressive uh, piece of his find. He found a Roman era uh, hoard of treasure uh, from around the year 400. This particular platter is 18 pounds, two feet across, silver. Can you imagine poking around, digging in the ground and finding that plus more uh, valuable ancient property? If it wasn't your property, you might be tempted to do like the man in the story. You'd give anything to own that property. Very similar story in verses 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. The picture on the right in this slide it's certainly a pearl of great price. Uh, it goes back to the 1500s. It was um, worn by royalty through many years. Uh, most recently, uh, it was a gift from Richard Burton to Elizabeth Taylor. And after her death, when her jewelry was sold off, this pearl necklace, uh, the bottom pearl is the old famous one, uh, this necklace sold for $12 million. The pearl at the bottom is an inch long. And if you know pearls, that is huge. So if you had the opportunity to buy a pearl like that, and you had just some, some little pieces of jewelry, uh, you would sell all that you have, so that you could have the pearl of great pride. The lesson should be obvious. You give up anything for the opportunity to have God's rule in your life, to be in God's kingdom.